Years ago, I mentioned Dairy Queen, years ago, it used to be a thing in Festus. Sunday night, after all the churches would dismiss, all the, I guess all of us Baptists and whoever, try to show up at Dairy Queen before the, before the other church got out. Because every time Sunday night, we'd get over to Dairy Queen, there'd be the other church people over there in line, and they'd be pulling in. That was back when it was a little white store, not that restaurant we liked it better when it was that little white store. All right. Revelation chapter 2. Here we are talking about the old days. Old days are gone and they're not coming back. Doesn't that make you sad sometimes? Old days don't come back around no more. But we have new days coming. And um, God's still good. God's still on the throne. He's still in charge of everything. God is in charge of everything. Nothing slipped by him. Nothing was outside of his view. And he wrote down everything that we need in this book. I, the, the message I preached down in Pea Ridge Friday night, you'll see it. Um, I let, I tell you who I really preach to, me. I let myself have it over believing stuff on the internet that is not true. I've done it, and God forbid, I, I said down there, sometimes I wish there weren't no internet, I'd probably be out of a job though, but um, there's, it's what's happening, here's what I see happening, the waters are getting so muddy on just everything with social media, TV, radio, you name it. Newspapers, magazines, the way the devil has taken over the speech of this world and just you have no idea what's true, what's not true anymore. And um, except this. And I promise you everything that we need is in this book. And if you read this book and you don't see something in here that you think we need, we don't need it. Some things God is silent about. That means it's not important. Move on to what is. So I have to learn the lessons like everybody else does. Revelation chapter 2 verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos. Write these things. And what was Pergamos known for? There was a temple there and it was the, um, forgot what God it was, but it was a, it was a big, big pagan temple there. And Jesus mentions here to this church, you're living in the city that Satan dwells in. Now think about this. Um, do animals have territories? Sure they do. They mark them. Lions, squirrels, dogs, cats, you name it. They have their territory. They have their area that they dwell in. The devil is a dragon. He's also described as a lion, a roaring lion. And he has his territory. And it's, it seems kind of funny to think that spirits dwell in literal, physical, three-dimensional world places, but they do. Every story that you've heard about a haunted house, do you believe in haunted houses? I do. I sure enough do. Yes, I do. Because spirits dwell in this world. They have habitations in this world. They have places where they live and like to live. It's just like, you ever been in an old house that nobody lived there for like 50 years? What's in there? You ain't going in there, are you? Varmints, critters, bats, rats, possums, raccoons, huh? Creepy crawlies, snakes, lizards. All kinds of stuff. Roaches. 
they dwell in these, in these houses that men built. And the Bible describes for us. In fact, we're in Revelation. I'll show it to you. Revelation 18. Oh, boy, my shoulder hurts. Watch me not be able to find it. Yeah, Revelation 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And notice this. Babylon has become the habitation of what? Devils. And Babylon is this world. And it, the world's systems, things in this world that are not good, the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. The, the word bird here refers to like the same thing that Jesus taught in the parable of the seed and the sower. In that parable, he said at first, some of the seed fell by the wayside and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Then when he gave the interpretation of the parable, he said Satan, or he said the wicked one, or the devil, came down and literally devoured it up. So birds in the Bible represent spirits. Think of the wings, okay? And so they have literal habitations in this world. And places where, hang on, I'll get to you in a second, David. Um, who remembers the Amityville murders okay i went back and and looked into that i remember when the movie came out and uh i went back and looked into that story now there's a family that lives in that house that house is still there and there's a family that lives in that house right now and they said they've had no problems in that house whatsoever so the family that owned the house before the what was it the lutz family before they moved in there was a murder in that house. The son of that family killed everybody in his family, murdered them in cold blood, blood everywhere. Okay? So the Lutz family moves in and they start having these problems. I mean, bad. There's one room, the temperature never got above like 40 degrees. Said it was just constantly freezing in this room. They brought a priest in to bless the house. That didn't work so well. Priest, priest told that family, that room that's cold, keep your kids out of there. He told them, he said, stay out of that room. And he left. Well, come to find out, the mom and dad, the Lutz couple, they did transcendental meditation. Eastern mysticism, where they basically were inviting spirits into their life. And the spirits in that house got so bad, it forced them out. They left and they sold the house for pennies on the dollar just to get rid of it. And people have lived in that house since then and have not had those problems. So I do believe that the spirits are there for a reason. A lot of it has to do with the type of people that are there and what they're doing. But that house for at least two families was a house of pure evil. And the second family didn't know what they were getting themselves into when they started meditating and inviting all these spirits in. Okay, but it, it went nuts on them real quick. So, yeah, I do. I do believe that spirit. I mean, if we're going to read this here in a minute, in fact, back in Revelation chapter two, verse 12, he said, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. So he's telling you in Pergamos, Satan literally dwelled there. Now, a spirit like Satan, he has powers above us, but he's not God. Where is the place that God cannot be? God's everywhere. Okay, God is the most high God. He sees all. He is everywhere. The Bible says that the universe, the heavens fit in the span of his hand. That's how big God is. So there's no place without God. But Satan has to have a place to dwell. 
And at this time, he's chosen Pergamos. He dwells in that city. And it says, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Uh, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. He, so he says, number one, his seat is there. That's his throne of authority. Number two, he dwells there. So every temple, pagan temple, they had idols in it. Idols are a representation of devils. And I guarantee you, devils dwell there. Guarantee you. The Bible tells us these things. So, yeah, I do. I believe people can become devil-possessed. Their body becomes a habitation of devils. I think houses, I think certain areas of the world, wilderness areas. Where did the Druids worship? In town? Druids wor did the Druids worship at the pub? No, they went to the woods. Because there, I believe there were Sylvanic spirits. Sylvan means woods, wood spirits. And they worshipped with trees and worshipped these gods that were... Why did God tell the Israelites not to plant groves? Why did certain kings have to come along and chop down the groves that they had built? Have you ever seen... Drive through Festus and Crystal City. Look in people's yards for a Virgin Mary statue in a flower garden. Where did they get that from? They got it from the Old Testament days where they, where they planted groves and put idols there and spirits literally dwelt there. And these kings had to come along that God had put his righteousness in and they had to cut them down because they knew they were not right. They, were knew, they knew they were against God and I believe they knew that spirits dwelt there. So they broke the idols and they cut down the grove. They didn't just break the idols up and get rid of them and leave the trees and the flowers. They cut the groves down so that the spirits had no dwelling place anymore. This Bible, I believe, is a... I've equated it to a Boy Scouts field guide. Boy Scout field guide will tell you when you're in the woods, look for these kind of snakes, look for these kind of trees... Leaves of three, leave them be, right? That's poison ivy. Uh, other things like that. And so the Bible, I believe, is a spirit guide. It's a guide to evil spirits and where they can be found. So Satan literally dwelled in Pergamos. And here is a church right in that town. You think they ever had problems? You think they ever had trouble? You better believe it. They were, they had Satan himself living in that town. Not some inferior devil, but Satan himself was living there. And Jesus commended them for that, but he's got to correct them too. But he introduces himself to the church in Pergamos as, These things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. And he says it, he says the same thing in Revelation 1.16, when John first described Jesus, he said he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Where do we see that description? Um, Revelation 19, turn there. Revelation 19, verse 11. This is Jesus returning to establish his kingdom. On the earth, thousand years. I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Mark it down. If the fight is worth it, Jesus is going to fight it. He is the captain of the host, the army of the Lord. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. I believe that's us. Where Enoch said, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. I believe that's us. 
uh, the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And we know from earlier in Revelation 19 that that fine linen, white and clean, is the righteousness given to us to wear by Christ. Uh, in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Out of his mouth. Now, I don't usually carry a knife in my mouth. But, I bet you this, I bet I can cut you to pieces with the words that I say. You know how they say, sticks and stones break my bones, but words may never harm me. That's not true, is it? Words once said are nearly impossible to put back in the mouth. Okay? That's why it's best to chew them up before they come out. But out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Um, look at Second uh, Thessalonians 2. When you notice in Revelation 9 that the sword is coming out of his mouth, Notice in Revelation 2, when it mentions the Antichrist, the man of sin, in verse 8, it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. The spirit of his mouth is what Paul said in Ephesians 6. You have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So how does Jesus destroy the Antichrist? With the Bible. How can you conquer the power that devils have over you? The word of God. How can you conquer sin? How can you conquer evil? How can you overcome in the world that we're living in right now? I had a, I had a pastor come up to me. I mentioned um, Friday night that I, you know, deal with depression anxiety every now and then and um, a pastor came to me one that I've been friends with and he said you know since I caught COVID he said I've been dealing with that you were mentioning earlier it's a scary sickness I don't know what all it does but he said ever since he caught that he's been battling it and he said it's like I'm in jail and I didn't do anything wrong. And he said, nearly every day, it's like that for him. He said, so he appreciated what I said, being honest about it. And I told him, I said, you know, I said, maybe, maybe God is weakening us so he can use us better. When we're strong, we usually get in God's way. When we're weak, God likes us weak. He told Paul that. When you're weak, Paul, then am I made strong. And uh, it, that was a blessing to him. But how do we overcome even when depression hits? And you, I woke up this morning, 530. Usually when I wake up early, that's a bad, that's going to be a bad time. Because you lay there in bed and all this stuff starts rolling through your head. And you're going, where in the world's that coming from? And I think there's devils just trying to get at you, trying to irritate you. It's like a mosquito in the middle of the night flying around your ear. They vex you. They bring displeasure to you. And so... I know that laying there is probably the worst thing that I can do. Get up, go read the Bible, try to get my mind off of that. Usually the best thing in the world to do. But here, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is quick, means it's alive. This book is not dead and neither is the God that wrote it. He's still alive. This book is alive. How can it be? Well, think of your DNA. 
your DNA technically is a crystal compound composed of amino acids and certain chemicals. And that's literally the sum total of it. But is that all it is? No. Because everything in this world that has life, that life comes literally from the DNA. That DNA in you is alive and it gives life. And trust me, if they're not already doing it, which I think they probably are, they can revive. If, if you had the money to spend and you had a dog that you loved and that dog died, you could take that DNA from that dog and rebirth that dog because of the DNA. They know how to do stuff like this now. Okay? In, in Great Britain, they are already amended their laws to allow for three parent babies. Babies that have been genetically modified with another human donor. So it has a mother, a father, but it also has DNA from a third party. That's crazy. On my birth certificate, I got one dad, one mom. Thank you. But it is literally possible now to have a child. They've been born already with multiple parents, more than two. So DNA is alive, and this Bible is the DNA of us Christians. It is alive, and it's powerful. When Jesus, the, the Pharisees marveled that Jesus was able to cast out devils with just his words. All he had to do was say, come out of him. And they might have thrown a fit, but they came out. They had to do what Jesus told them to do because they were afraid of him. They knew who he was. So the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Everything you intend to do, God's figured you out already. Everything you plan on doing, everything you think. When Jesus was with people on this earth, he always knew their thoughts, didn't he? And Jesus knew their thoughts, the Bible says. So he would answer them and they would like, how did he know we were thinking that? It's, and I'll be honest with you, it's starting to get creepy now. When you go to your browser and get ready to type something in and Google's already figured out what you're looking for. That's artificial intelligence becoming a God with God-like powers. Okay, that's the world we live in right now. But that's the word of God. When you read it, you find out that God already has you figured out. He already knows you. He can see inside your heart. He can see in your mind. He knows what you're thinking and he knows what you're planning before you even do it. Can you beat a God who already knows every muscle that you're going to twitch? No, you can never beat him. Ever. And that's the beauty of it. So it's best just to surrender to him. Amen. You caught me, God. I'm yours. Amen. What is the purpose of a sword? What is its meaning? Turn to Judges 7. I'll show you how powerful the sword is. Now, if you haven't noticed, there's somebody in this church carrying a weapon. Okay? Now, some people, that may make them feel uncomfortable. And in a way, we kind of hope it does. Because the purpose of carrying a weapon and letting somebody know you're carrying a weapon, what's the purpose in that? Yeah. I'm letting you know right now, I'm, I'm not somebody you want to try to steal my wallet. I'm not somebody you want to try to attack my wife. And 
that's all said by just the mere fact that they can see your gun. I mean, what did the mafia guys do? Were they showing you your rib cage? Guido said he wants to see you. I don't want to see Guido. Guido wasn't asking. Right? Yeah. Guido wasn't asking. They show you the gun. I guess I better go see Guido. That's the purpose of it. Reagan, Ronald Reagan knew this. Ronald Reagan refused to cut the defense budget. And he, and he knew that if we built up so many munitions, army men, nuclear weapons, that it was called mutually assured destruction. That if, that if Russia ever decided to come against us, we're going to push buttons. And our missiles will pass each other through the air and there'll be no, there'll be no war after that. There'll be nobody left to fight. So the whole purpose, if America, if America under the current administration decides to shut down all of our missiles, park all of our tanks, all of our ships, send all of our military guys home and burn all of our guns. Do we stand a chance? No, we'll be taken over just like that. America's a rich nation. We've got minerals, we've got oil, we've got farmland. We, we've got everything we need and the rest of the world knows it. And they want it. They want it. China would come over here in a day and take this nation over if we decided to let down our weapons. So the purpose of just carrying a sword sends a message to your enemies. Don't try it. The purpose of carrying a sword is in the hopes that you'd never have to use it. Gary, you ever killed a man? You ever thought about it? No, I don't answer that one. If you had to, would you? It'd be a hard time, yeah. And I'm like you. I would never, ever want to take somebody's life. So don't come after my wife. Or one of my grandchildren. Or one of my church members. Or my sister. Jealous. Yeah. Look at Judges 7.15. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned into the host of Israel. Remember, Gideon's army is how many? 300. That's it. And he's facing thousands of the Moabites. And he said, Arise, for the Lord had delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps with the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So imagine the, the camp of the Midianites. Thousands of men down there. But they've been circled by 300 men who are holding lamps inside of clay pitchers. And a sword. And they break the pitcher so the light comes on all around them. Well, what do they think? Each one of those lights, there's a thousand men behind those. So they're going, we're dead. We're surrounded. So what happened? They cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. 
And 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. They killed each other in the panic. That happened again in the days of Jehoshaphat. I love that story. They just, the three armies killed one another. And the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah and Zerath, and to the border of Abel Meholah, unto Tabath. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. They didn't even have to fight. They just held the light up and said, we've all got swords. And they all took off. The hope is when you bear the sword, you'll never have to use it. Turn to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned and God was going to thrust them out of the Garden of Eden, it says in verse 24, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So if there is a guy standing outside the door of the church with his hand on his pistol, is anybody going to come in the church? No. The purpose of that sword was to guard the entrance and to keep the way of the tree of life. Did, they, did the angels ever have to use it? No. Because you would be a fool to try to get past that sword, you'd be a fool. And so the purpose of holding that sword there at the entrance to the way of the tree of life was basically, once people saw the sword, they were never going to go past it. That was not going to happen. And I want you to think about that example. What is our sword? Who are our enemies, principalities and powers, rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places who are not afraid of a 32 caliber. They're not afraid of a 50 caliber. They're not afraid of an AR-15. They're not afraid. They're not afraid of a nuclear bomb. They're afraid of this book, Gary. This book causes devils to wet themselves they cannot handle the sight of the word of god the presence of the word of god babylon she can't handle it she hates it she tries to have it destroyed everywhere she goes and so devils fear the sword of the lord you hear that that's our new furnace it's loud Okay, but at least we know it works. Amen. To keep the way of the tree of life. Deuteronomy 28, 22. Look at this. Look what God. Here's the purpose of the sword. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption. This is because they did what God told them not to do. And with a fever and with an inflammation, with an extreme burning and with the sword. And what did God do? You read the book of, of Judges. Every time Israel got into sin and worshiping Ashtaroth and worshiping Baal, God sent the sword after him. What did he do? He sent armies of men that came in and held swords against all the Israelites and said, you now are our slaves, you're our servants. You remember the story in 1 Samuel 13? And the Philistines, under Saul's reign, had so much power that they would not allow the Jews to have any blacksmith shops all throughout the land of Israel. And the purpose for that, specifically stated in the scriptures, 1 Samuel 13, was so that the Jews could not make staves or swords or spears, weapons. Take away the weapons. And specifically for that reason, the Philistines said, in case a war breaks out, we don't want to have to fight the Jews. So, 
1933, Hitler takes control of Germany. He's now chancellor. And what does he do to the Jews? Took away all their rights. He stole, their, he stole the money out of their bank accounts. Took away their rights as citizens. Whatever rights they had in Germany. And if any Jew, I guarantee you, if any Jew had a weapon, the brown shirts came in and took them. And it left the Jews defenseless. From what we know from history, the only Jews that fought back was in the uh, ghetto uprising in Warsaw, Poland. The Germans had forced all the Jews into one neighborhood. And I mean, they were thick in there. But they figured out they could move through the sewers un unnoticed. And they grabbed whatever they could. They would kill German soldiers, steal their guns. They would take picks, shovels, pitchforks, any kind of gun they could steal or get their hands on. And the Jews in Warsaw, Poland, one day, it's called the, it's called the, uh, Jew, what, what precinct was that Warsaw? But it was, it was the Warsaw Uprising. And one day, these Jews said, we've had enough. We know that when we get on those trains, we're not going to a factory somewhere to work. We know that when we get off that train, you're going to kill us. We would rather die fighting than just lay down and die. And they fought back. They lost. But those Jews said, we're not, we're not dying in your gas chamber. We're going to die with whatever we got in our hands, killing our enemies. But we're not, we're not, gonna, we're not just going to lay down for you guys. They fought back. But God said, because you won't obey me in Deuteronomy 28, I'm going to send the sword in. And they're going to round you up. They're going to take you prisoner. You're going to be their slaves. That's the purpose of it. It's God's judgment against a nation that will not regard him. Do you think America is exempt from that? Not a chance. Deuteronomy 33 verse 29. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency? If Israel, let's say us, if we're serving God and doing right, not only will God be our shield so that we can defend ourselves against the fiery darts of the wicked. Tell me what you think the fiery darts represent. What do you think? What does the devil throw at you to try to destroy you, to try to hurt you, to try to kill you, to try to weaken you? I've told you a lot of mine. Depression. Days where I just, man, it just consumes me. I can't think. And those are his darts that he uses to get at me. There's others. Everybody's got them. He throws darts at people. We actually can defend ourselves now because God is our shield. And now that he said, the sword of, of, our, of thy excellency, God is also our sword. And can you think? Of a superior weapon. Uh-uh. If we had. A, when, when the decision was made. To bomb Hiroshima, Japan. It was made because. The Japanese. Refused. To surrender. And we were bombing Japan. We were taking back the islands. That they had taken. We were, we were hurting them bad. We were killing citizens in Japan, bom dropping bombs on Japanese cities. And Tojo, the head of the army in Japan, the Supreme General, refused to surrender. And the Japanese people weren't going to surrender. They would rather die because their emperor told them to. So Truman was left without a choice. We're going to have to drop this bomb. Dropped it twice. 
And even after that, we found out that the emperor was, they tried to assassinate the emperor's own generals tried to assassinate him because he was going to surrender to the Americans. And those generals said, we're not surrendering. Even though we had bombed Nagasaki and Hiroshima with superior weapons. Japanese didn't have them. We did. They still were not going to surrender to the Americans. And had the emperor been killed, we'd have had to drop another one. Probably on Tokyo. But with a superior weapon, that tends to tell your enemies... You mean business. Amen. Father, bless your word. Every day we're without it. We are hopeless, defenseless, and at risk. And every day we have it in our minds, in our hearts, in our hands. Every day we have your word. There's nothing that can harm us. Nothing can hurt us. Bless your word. And Father, put it in our hearts to never go anywhere without it. To keep your word and never let it go. Bless it in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.